And in the middle of the night, my phone just starts blowing up. I'm like, what the hell? I pick it up. It's, it's Ann Fletcher. I text her. I'm like, Mary, it is the middle of the night. I'm in the UK. What do you want? She said, Jen, you need to call me now. So I call her and she goes, I've created a role for you in Hocus Pocus 2. I want you to play drag version of Winifred Sanderson. Bring me the bad Hello. Hi, how are you, Ginger? I'm fantastic. How are you? I am fantastic as well. I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited to be here. I could spit. <laughs> <laughs> well, this I'm Adam, by the way, and this is a podcast about you and your journey in music. And we'll talk about, obviously, Hocus Pocus 2 and the, the show and everything else that you have coming. Sounds right? great. Amazing. Uh, I did read Born and Raised in Florida. Is that what I saw? Yeah. So I'm Leesburg, Florida, which a lot of people are like, oh, Florida's not really the South. Where do you get that accent? It's like, no, the further north you go in Florida, the further south you actually are. Um, yeah, I'm, it is interesting. I just recently moved to Nashville and I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and a lot of people don't believe it until you take them to Leesburg and they're like, oh, yeah, this is basically Alabama. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and did you get into, how'd you get into music? Did you come from a musical family at all? Uh, no, nobody in my family can sing. They're all tone deaf. None of them like to be in front of a crowd. Uh, so it was really kind of weird. Like there were many ways that I stuck out from the crowd when I was little and my musicality tended to be one of like the, the main key factors. Um, I started singing in the church because it was really the only creative outlet that I really had at that time that um, I was allowed to participate in. And then mm -hmm. eventually that led to like doing children's theater and eventually theater from there and blah, 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 blah. And so on until eventually I became this. Okay. So you started off in the church. Were you always performing? Like, it sounds like that was a, a release and a creative release for you to do, especially the church choir. Like, was that something, you know, early on that you wanted to pursue? Um, I did want to pursue it, but I, I didn't know what the outlet would be for me because, you know, I'm short, I'm fat and very, very queer. So it was like there weren't a whole lot of options for me when I was growing up, especially like representation as far as movies and TV and music went. Um, so it wasn't until I got a little bit older and kind of fell into drag that the opportunity started to really just appear. And I'm the time I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna take every opportunity that comes my way, throw everything up against the wall, see what sticks and then run with it. Sure. How do you how do you fall? How'd you fall into drag? I got cast in a, a brand new play that oh look, I'm dripping my my lipstick is dripping. I got so excited. I told you um, <laughs> I got cast in a brand new play at the Orlando Fringe Festival called Boys, Boys, Boys. And the casting announcement was for eight men willing to go completely nude or two drag queens. And I knew that my mama would want to come and see the play. So I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to get naked. I want to stay <laughs> in the wheel. And I thought, well, drag can't be that difficult. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just jumped into drag from there. And like, unbeknownst to me, I happened to be actually pretty good at it. So I started getting offers from people who came to see that show. And through theater, kind of fell into the drag career that I have. Interesting. So from that one, from that one performance, mm -hmm. other people, other what producers and people putting on shows sort of reaching yeah. out. So a, a lot of people from the, I guess it, the real drag scene here in Orlando, you know, like the, the bars, the nightclubs, they mm -hmm. came to see that show because the, the Fringe Festival here, it's, it's huge. And everybody in town goes every year, see every show. And they were like, oh, you're new. You're a new cross dresser. And I think that you're actually pretty good. So why don't you come over to my club and I'll give you a hundred bucks and you can sing some songs. And that's really how I got started. I was just, you know, really very new to drag, very fresh, didn't have much uh, outfits to choose from, many wigs, <laughs> wasn't great at makeup, but I could sing and I could mm -hmm. tell jokes. And I, I just started taking all of the money that I would make from that and reinvesting it into better wigs and better dresses and better jewelry and better makeup. And eventually- oh. <laughs> Interesting, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that became, 
was were you like uh attending school for music or anything like that prior to that or was was no. theater some just something that you were doing and then having to land this role which then ended up kind of opening the doors to it sounds like a lot of other opportunities yeah i mean i went to one semester of community college okay and went broke trying to make it through that semester uh so i i just i had this come to jesus meeting with myself and i was like look you can either do this or you can't there's really not a whole lot more that you're going to learn from these classes sure. either you're going to be a good singer actor dancer or you're not um and so i decided just to kind of take the skills that i did possess and go out there and audition for anything and everything and learn on the job learn along the way and uh, I, it's not something that i would necessarily suggest for everybody if mm -hmm. you have the means to be able to go to school and get your degree and do all those things more power to you but i did not have any of those things when i was growing up i didn't have the resources so i just kind of had to put it into action and make it happen Sure. I mean, obviously, people that go to school for music, it's kind of like the end game is to eventually do it professionally. And if you've kind of already achieved that to, to some capacity, it's like, what's the point? Of even? Exactly. <laughs> what more are you going to learn? Right? And I would say some of it's <laughs> luck, but, you know, it's, there's that old saying that you can work your entire life to become an overnight sensation. And I really feel like that's what it was for me, because I was working, you know, three or four gigs a day seven days a week for years and years and years for very little money just to get out there and get better and and make the, who i am more polished and, and more um valuable to people who sure. are booking shows and so after all of that hard work i got on rupaul's drag race and suddenly everyone around the world knew who i was which was very jarring but still very satisfying Oh, I'm sure uh, to, to land that. Was that something uh, a producer or somebody found you performing at a, a club or something? Uh, no. So back in the day, but when there was only one season of drag race per year, you know, now there's right. like 10, 15 seasons a year. Um, they really relied on the former contestants to give their their uh, suggestions for the upcoming season. Oh, and cool. Being here in Orlando, having grown up doing drag, here in this community, there were a lot of people. There was like uh, Roxy Andrews and Latrice Royale and Coco Montrese and Alexis Mateo, all these girls, detox, were like, you've got to see Ginger Minj. She would be great for the show. So the producers reached out to me. This was like a, a Monday. Mm -hmm. And they said, we've got your name from all these girls. We think you'd be really fantastic. We'd like to see an audition video from you. I said, okay, well, how long do I have to do that? They said, we need it by Thursday. So if you can send it Wednesday, that would be great. And I was like, but I, this is before like the iPhones made it easy to film and edit all these. Right. Things. So I'm like, like, I gotta go rent a camera. To <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I made probably the worst audition video in Drag Race history. <laughs> like things were literally falling down around me. And I was like, they are never going to call me back. They called me back. And they put me through to the next round and then the next round and the next round. And then when I got cast, I remember my very first day, um, one of the producers, the one who had reached out to me originally came up and said, do you know why you got cast? And I, I said, no, <laughs> do I need to ask why? And he said, because we were sitting down and watching your audition video with RuPaul and like you've knocked the curtains down. So now the pool's behind you. The the ceiling fan is like dropping things on top of you. You you have the CD is skipping and you just kept going. And Rue thought that, that was the perfect allegory for drag. The whole world can be falling down around you, but you just keep going. And that's why when people ask me year after year, like, what do I do for my audition? What do I do? I was like, just be you. Do right. one take. Show them who you are, what you have to offer. And if shit goes wrong, that's going to work in your favor because they want to see how you deal with the other things that are around you, how you deal with life when it gets thrown at you. Right. I feel like that's another reason why like TikTok and, and the social media platforms have become so popular. It's just the very authentic and not polished aspect of the entire thing. Yeah. I and mean, people want to peek behind the curtain sometimes. Right. It's right. not like, yeah, you want to go watch a movie or whatever, and you want it to be beautiful and you want it to look great and be the funniest take or whatever. But sometimes there, there's something really lovable 
and um, it, it kind of connects with people a little bit more when you can let your guard down and be like, well, it's not the best take, but we had fun doing it, you know? Right, right. And Ginger could ha handle the situation and didn't care and, and, and was just confident enough to be like, you know what? We're going to send it in anyway. Exactly. <laughs> well, they were like, you have the nerve. To <laughs> oh, that's really funny. Um, speaking to uh, the, you mentioned films, but um, just going off of your Wikipedia and I've gotten burned on this before. Uh, it looks like you just had a birthday and you are pretty much the same age as me. So you must have grown up with the original Hocus Pocus film. I did. I did. I remember. So for a lot of people don't really recall the Hocus Pocus uh, was released in July when it came out. Okay, because I don't remember want, that. I just remember watching the yeah. film a million times. <laughs> they didn't want it to go directly opposite Nightmare Before Christmas. So they released it in July and it didn't do very well. But the good thing about that, like me being poor when I was growing up was we couldn't afford to go to the regular movie theaters. We had to wait a couple months till they came to the dollar theater. Oh, I love and the so dollar theater. It came to the dollar theater during October, during the Halloween season. So my first time seeing this movie was during, like when everything you walk out and there's pumpkins and ghosts and everybody's ready for a spoopy season. And <laughs> I got to see it then and it really resonated with me. Um, of course, you know, I loved the costumes and the witches and the magic and all that, but it was really the I put a spell on you scene mm -hmm. where Bette Midler's just doing what Bette Midler does and being so incredible as a singer dancer entertainer and the the other two behind her just hamming up and having a good time that was the scene that stuck with me so i would save all of my lunch money i didn't i know you can look at me and be like you gave up lunch money yes i gave up all of my lunch money for three weeks in a row so i could continue to go to that dollar theater and watch the movie over and over and over Wow, that's amazing. And to land the role, basically this the <laughs> Bette Miller's role of, 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 you know, the drag version in the film, right? Yeah, it, it was like, so how crazy. It was so weird the way it happened. I was in the UK, I was playing Ursula in this drag Disney villains tour that was going all throughout the UK last October. And I had done Dumplin' on Netflix a couple of years before that um, with Ann Fletcher, she directed it. And I had seen that she was directing Hocus Pocus 2. And in the middle of the night, my phone just starts blowing up. I'm like, what the hell? I pick it up, it's Ann Fletcher. I text her, I'm like, Mary, it is the middle of the night. I'm in the UK, what do you want? She said, Ginge, you need to call me now. So I call her and she goes, I've created a role for you in Hocus Pocus 2. I want you to play drag version of Winifred Sanderson and you're going to get in a fight with Bette Midler. And I said, okay, sign me up. Let me be there. I'll be there. <laughs> and the next thing I know, like we're there, we're, we're dressed and we're getting ready to go on the set. And the three of us are looking at each other like, we are, we're dressed like Kathy and Jimmy and Bette Midler and Sarah Jessica Parker. And we're about to be about five feet away from them filming this movie with like, what do we do? What do we say? They didn't give us a chance to say anything. <laughs> that I walked on, on screen and, and it was literally maybe two or three weeks after the finale of All-Star Six and Bette Midler goes, you were robbed. And then <laughs> Kathy goes over to Cornbread and Bette comes to me and Sarah Jessica Parker goes over to Kimora and they just start complimenting us on our careers and the things that we've done and, and telling us what big fans they were. So it was so, it was surreal, but it was also really disarming. So they didn't give us an opportunity to be nervous around them. That's good. I mean, the, to, did you tell Bette Miller the story of saving your lunch money to go see the film so many times in the, you uh, know, during that season? I have not told her that story. <laughs> That's we didn't a great a whole one. lot of time to chit chat. Sure. Um, but the times that we did, you know, the three of them were so kind to us um, and they really looked out for us. Like, I will never forget, it was it was like a close-up of mine. And, you know, I, I've done a few movies, a few TV things, but I really don't know a whole lot about the technical side, about lining up the shot and making mm -hmm. sure the lighting is coming from a different angle or whatever. And Bette Midler just stops and goes, no, 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 bring the monitor. I'm like, 
oh God, what did I do? They bring the monitor over and she's looking, it looked fine to me. Like it was whatever. I was just happy to be there. She's like, no, that light should be coming from over here. And the camera needs to be sitting there. Da, 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 da. We'll be in the trailer. And she grabs my arm and drags me away. And she, she's like, don't worry. I'm your new mother. I'm going to make sure you're taken care of. Um, so I was like, Bette Midler is my new drag mother. That's amazing. And, has, <laughs> and then she showed me when we got back the monitor and everything that she said that they went and fixed was absolutely right. It was correct. And the shot looked so much better. Uh, and I never would have known the difference. But now I know to look out for those things because sure. I'm somebody like her. Like a true pro. <laughs> at the very end of it, she told me, I love the way that you do me. So I'd like for you to take this and go do something else with it. So I sat down and I created this Hocus Pocus Halloween Bash tour. So that that's where that all spun out? Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. So that starts on Friday, right? Starts on Friday. We kick off in Atlanta, Georgia, and then we're going all around the country. We've got a few more dates that we're working on that are going to be released later. Um, and it's it's so fun. It's People always ask me, what is it? What is it about? It's about an hour. Okay. Um, and <laughs> It's about an hour. It takes... <laughs> All of the pieces of the original movie that people know and love and some of the, the soon to be iconic moments from the new movie. Okay. And it's all put together with this brand new original plot line. So it's a wholly new show with things that people know and love. And if you've ever wanted to hear the Sanderson sisters sing WAP, now is your chance. Amazing, amazing. I, yeah, I can't, are you, from what I saw, I think that's the closest to me, I'm in Nashville. Um, but I would love, I, I think that's such a cool idea. And then you have a music video for uh, I've Got a Spell on You coming out as well. Is that what I said? Yeah. So, you know, of course, like the drag community, everybody in the world loves the Sanderson sisters. We mm -hmm. know that. But it's become such a staple within the drag community over the last 30 years where you cannot walk into any gay bar from, from here to eternity without seeing some drag queen performing I Put a Spell on You from September to November, somewhere in there. And we thought, you know, it, it's great. We love that version, but why don't we do something that is wholly new and unique and specific to the drag community? It's kind of a love letter to all my drag sisters. Um, and it puts it in a new key where if we want to sing it live, we can, and it's comfortable because we're not all Bette Midler. Sure. So we decided to redo that song. It's uh, what you expect with some new like twists and turns in there. And we've done a music video to go with it that is a, a loving tribute to the original. So hopefully you'll check all of those things out and then come see us. Oh. oh, definitely. I definitely will. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Ginger. I have Real quick, I just want a real quick question and then I have one more quick one as well. But I want to know, I know you put out a couple country records or you put out Double White Diva. Is that something that you will continue doing or is another? Yeah. Uh, is that just kind of a past project? Oh, okay. No, no. I, you know, I grew up listening to nothing but country music and I felt like for so long, even though it was such a part of me growing up, that it was like the antithesis of drag. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to get away from it for so long. But as I got older, I found myself just going back to singing those songs that I loved so much growing up. And then I went, oh, my gosh, my voice really is more suited to this country music. So it took me a while to work up the nerve to actually put pen to paper and come up with a, a full country album. But then when I did, it just kind of exploded in, in, in the 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 response that we got from it not only from the drag race community but particularly from the country music community was so overwhelming and it it really felt like it was the first it's my third album my third studio yeah. album but it was the first one that felt really authentic to okay. me and it's something that i love doing so much that i'm gonna keep singing country i love it i love it thank you again so much my last quick question is if you have any advice for aspiring artists aspiring artists don't do what i did and try to be what other people want you to be you just kind of got to go with what you know what makes you happy because at the end of the day especially if you're like doing an album or something you know it, it can be a beautiful little compact disc recording it could be a giant uh, lp whatever it's gonna be a paperweight <laughs> <laughs> if people don't respond to it, but it should be something that you're proud of and proud to, to put on your desk and look at at the end of the day, whether anybody else responds to it or not, you have to be comfortable with it, love it and be proud of it. Bring it
Yeah.